Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning, everyone. It is so wonderful to be here to welcome you all to be part of this amazing celebration of our Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health graduates and family. To our distinguished faculty and staff, thank you for your tireless work to make today possible. To the families and friends who've joined us from all over the world, I say thank you. Thank you for your sacrifices, the sacrifices that you've made to be here, and for all of the love and support that you've offered our graduates. No one gets here alone. This day is yours too, and you deserve, as family members and friends and supporters, you deserve your own round of applause. Thank you. And to our Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health Class of 2019, congratulations. You've made it. It's hard to not stand here and beam with pride, the pride of looking out at all of you. This is a class of distinction on so many levels. Altogether, 606 of you are receiving degrees. You've come from all over the globe, from 55 countries and 37 states in the US, plus the District of Columbia. And importantly, 365 women will walk across this stage to receive their diplomas. Fact, that fact holds a special significance today. It is a testament to how far we've come as a university, as a school, as a field of public health, and as a society. After all, just think about this. It was exactly a hundred years ago this spring that Alice Hamilton, a renowned industrial health expert, was named assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. She was the first female faculty member in university history. At the time, Harvard didn't even admit female students. The New York Tribune lauded the occasion of Dr. Alice Hamilton's appointment with a headline that read, and I quote, a woman on Harvard's faculty the last citadel has fallen. The sex has come into its own. <laughs> yes, Alice Hamilton's appointment was an extraordinary milestone, but it came with a fair share of skeptics and more than a few restrictions. Let me share some with you. For starters, Alice was barred from the male-only faculty club she couldn't even get tickets to the Harvard football games. And she was asked not to embarrass the university by taking part in academic ceremonies such as this one. Now, you might ask yourself, what would possess Hamilton to pursue a career in which she'd encounter such disregard, even disdain as a woman? In her autobiography, Alice humbly explained, and here I quote, I chose medicine not because I was scientifically minded, for I was deeply ignorant of science. I chose to become a doctor because as a doctor, I could go anywhere I pleased, to far off lands or city slums, and be quite sure that I could be of use anywhere. And so go anywhere she did, even when it raised eyebrows, even when it was uncomfortable. As a young woman, Alice moved into Hull House, 
a settlement in working class immigrant families in the neglected 19th Ward of Chicago. She wanted to understand the daily reality of the living poor, of their working conditions, and the poverty that they faced, and to put her medical training to use however and wherever she could. While living there in Hull House, she opened the settlement's first well clinic for infants and young children. She searched far and wide the surrounding neighborhoods, investigating the root cause of typhoid fever and tuberculosis, diseases that plagued the community, and she educated mothers about prevention. Hamilton's years at Hull House were formative. Life in a settlement does several things to you, she would later say. Among others, it teaches you that education and culture have little to do with real wisdom, the wisdom that comes from life experiences. That realization that you have to truly understand the lived experience of other people in order to make a difference in their lives becomes our North Star. It was her North Star that guided her remarkable career. Long before Alice came to Harvard, she spent decades researching industrial health on the ground, observing workers that she would call workers in dangerous trades. These trades included the lead and enamel ware industries, rubber production, and explosive manufacturing, just to name a few. She went down into the mines, she visited hospital wards, and she talked her way onto factory floors, all to better understand the hazards of these jobs. In the process, Alice became a leading authority on industrial diseases. But Alice Hamilton was not content in merely proving that these occupational dangers existed. She didn't stop at collecting field notes, analyzing data, or writing up reports. Instead, she used those findings to sound the alarm to fight for the much needed safety standards. It really is impossible to overstate the impact Alice Hamilton had on the nascent field of occupational health and the well-being of industrial workers across the country. Her research, her advocacy helped shape scores of state and federal policies, including the landmark Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, which, by the way, was signed into law just three months after she died at the age of 101 years. A century after Alice Hamilton first set foot on this campus, the influence of Alice's work still ripples across our community. Today, the Education and Resource Center for Occupational Health and Safety is training the next generation of leaders to address the health risks facing the modern workforce. And I can't help but think about how proud Alice would have been of our own Dr. Diana Sabalis, who is investigating hazardous exposure in a variety of industries, particularly those that employ vulnerable populations. Dr. Sabellis teaches a class called Introduction to the Work of the Environment. Introduction to the Work Environment. And her students aren't just learning about occupational hazards, they're spreading their knowledge, democratizing their knowledge in the most effective way possible using that wonderful tool that we now call Wikipedia. I remember I used to tell my son that Wikipedia was not in and of itself sufficient source for research. I have since changed my tune, and that is because so many of us have had the opportunity to improve the text and the evidence that is on that platform. So, 
the group that has been working with Dr. Sabalis has found their way to use technology to contribute evidence, evidence-based factual content on risks in a wide range of workplace settings from electronic waste processing facilities all the way to the work that it, people are exposed to in the U.S. Air Force. That's taking knowledge and putting out into space where it can make a positive impact on the lives of workers. But I would say that Alice Hamilton's greatest contribution was the doors that she pried open and the example that she set for all of those who would follow her. Graduate students like your own Jasmine Hall, who today Jasmine has a big fan club. <laughs> Jasmine Hall, who today receives a master's in public health in neuropsychiatric epidemiology. Jasmine grew up in Flint, Michigan, in a neighborhood that lacked necessities like fresh, healthy foods and green spaces. Her community was recently traumatized further by the water crisis. Jasmine plans to take her Harvard training and return home to Flint with degrees in hand to study the socio-demographic, genetic, and environmental influences that affect mental and neurological health and to better the well-being of her community. Alice would be proud, Jasmine. And, and, and think about other graduates like Angel Rosario. <laughs> Angel was recognized as a gifted and talented student at a very young age, which helped him land a spot at an accelerated middle school on the Upper West Side, a world, a world far away from his home in Harlem. Angel saw the vast disparities rooted in race, poverty, homophobia, and language differences firsthand. And now, his goal with an Harvard Chan School education is to help eliminate those disparities by working to make the US and the global health systems more equitable and more just. We also... We also see Hamilton's influence reflected in the ordinary women who are leading our field today, the improving health and well-being across all of our communities. Women like our very special guest, Cecile Richards, who has helped, <laughs> yes, Cecile Richards, who has helped expand health care to millions of American women particularly those in rural and underserved communities. We are so delighted to have Ms. Richards here with us today. We're also inspired by women like Kate Nordahl, a beloved member of the Harvard Chan School family who tragically passed away last April. At Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Foundation, Kate served as the senior director of coverage and oversaw Massachusetts Medicaid Policy Institute. She also directed the foundation's Massachusetts Health Reform Survey, tracking trends in healthcare access and affordability. So many of us have been touched by Kate's life, by her passion for helping people, her dedication for improving healthcare across the Commonwealth. Alice Hamilton's spirit endures in today's generation of public health visionaries in a profound way. She fundamentally changed the way we think about our mission. She impressed us, she impressed upon us that public health is more than academics. It is about activism. And that is the lesson that I hope each of you will take with you as you make your way back out into the world. Because today, we know that our health doesn't just affect every aspect of our lives. Every aspect of our lives 
affects our health. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the foods we consume, our access to vaccines and preventive care, how much we exercise, and our proximity to green spaces, the strength of our social connections, the quality of our schools, and the safety of our workplaces and homes, our economic security, whether we suffer discrimination, emotional trauma, or violence. And these factors shape the quality of our lives and the health of our communities. And we know that large-scale change, large-scale change in the environments we live, the behaviors we practice, the policies that shape our everyday realities will not happen on its own. So it's up to us, it's up to us to make sure that our work is not confined to laboratories or research clinics, that our discoveries don't languish in white papers or journals. It's up to us to see that we learn to not only change hearts and minds, but that we also contributing to changing outcomes. I encourage each of you to think about your role in public health through that lens. Whether you stay in academia or go into government or join the nonprofit or private sectors, remember that public health requires, encumbers a responsibility for taking action. No matter where you've headed, today you leave here with a diploma and the knowledge base that will take you far. You have an amazing foundation that will help you think critically and find solutions to even our most vexing complex problems. I hope that you'll remember what you got into this work, why you got into this work in the first place, and what you seek to accomplish. Remember the problems you felt compelled to solve and the lives you felt called to improve. And I hope you'll venture out of the hollowed halls of institutions like this one. I hope that you will break out of your comfort zones, that you will immerse yourself in new environments as Alice had, that you will get your hands dirty, that you will talk directly with the people you wish to serve, and most importantly, that you listen that you listen to them, that you see them, to get to know their lives and their needs intimately. That will allow you to observe things you have never would have seen from afar, to understand things you never could from a distance. That's how you'll go from being an academic to an academic advocate. Only then will you truly realize the power you hold to make change. And in the end, that is what each of us is called to this field to do, to make change. Decades after Alice Hamilton first set foot on this campus, and long after she retired, she looked back on her extraordinary life, on all the places that she traveled, and the body of work that she had contributed to, and she had this to say. For me, the satisfaction is that things are better now, and I had some part in it. Each of you started your own journey in public health because you dared to envision a healthier world, a more just world. I'm so proud of you reaching this first milestone in that pursuit and for the ways in which I know each of you, each of you too, will have a profound part in realizing that vision. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to serve as your dean and to take this journey with you. Thank you to the class of 2019 and congratulations.